And welcome to Politics Now. We're sitting down with Clark County Commission candidate and longtime state senator, state assemblyman Tick Sigerblum. Thanks very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. So you won your primary in your county commission race by 181 votes, nearly 12,000 votes cast. That's that's coming pretty close. It's a little over one percent, but it's way closer than I thought. Yeah. Well, you said you were surprised by that result. I was. I mean, Everybody said we're doing great, but so I had soft to my opponent. He really did a good campaign. It's um, you know very negative, but but he, he he got a lot of votes. Now this this race was essentially a referendum on the Raider Stadium. You were an opponent of the Raider Stadium. You voted against it in Carson City during that special session. Your opponent was essentially put up by the laborers' union, which of course benefits from the construction jobs that are created at, at, at that stadium. Do you have any second thoughts, any regrets about your vote? I think it's a little late for that now, but <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I don't. I mean, it, I didn't oppose totally the stadium, but the fact that we were brought up there by Sheldon Adelson and told, here, take it or leave it, uh, to me as a legislator, I couldn't stomach that. Kind of ironic, too, because uh, later that deal between Sheldon Adelson and the uh, Raiders kind of collapsed under similar terms. They told him, take it or leave it, and he left it. Exactly. <laughs> So I don't know why he's funding my opponent, which he is, um, because I said the, the stadium ended up being a non-issue for him. But um, that, that's what it is. Now this, is, this has got to be the first time in my memory, at least, that Sheldon Adelson and a labor union have been on the same side of any, of any issue. Absolutely. And the Democratic primary, which you know, he just gave $100 million to the Republican caucus in, in Washington, D.C. He's, he's you know, the biggest Republican donor in the country. So to get in my race is pretty amazing. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Um, now, uh, if you get elected to the job, you face a Republican opponent in November, but it's a very overwhelmingly uh, Democratic district, uh, represented by Chris June Kiliani now. Um, uh, do you think there's going to be any awkwardness at the meeting between yourself and, say, uh, Marilyn Kirkpatrick, who's rumored to be one of the candidates for the next chair? She endorsed your opponent, Steve Sisolak who's the chairman now, if he doesn't get elected governor, he'll be back for two years. He endorsed your opponent. Is that going to be an awkward meeting? I don't think so. You know, I, I've been around politics long enough that, at least from my perspective, you know, you, you just you have a battle, you win or lose, and then you go on. So um, it, it doesn't bother me. They, for them it might be, but I don't think so. I mean, we're, we're all been around a long time, and, hmm. and uh, you take your best shot, and you either win or you lose. In my case, I won, so I feel pretty good. Yeah. One of the, one of the things I noticed on election night was that progressives did not seem to do very well. Uh, Chris June Kiliani at the top of the ticket in the governor's race, uh, um, uh, Senator Pat Spearman and Amy Valela in CD4, uh, uh, Rob Langford is running for DA against Steve Wolfson, uh, you winning by, by just 181 uh, votes. Uh, is, the, is the progressive part of the Democratic Party in jeopardy, uh, or, or, or are there other issues that explain those things? I think what's really happened is that the, what was traditionally the right wing of the Democratic Party has moved to the left. Hmm. So as you saw with the Sisolak, his commercials were very pro-abortion um, you know, or pro-Planned Parenthood, anti-gun. So all the big issues they basically have adopted from the left wing. So I tell people Bernie Sanders really won in 2016 because everything he stood for, now everybody stands for. Hmm. So um, I think in that sense it's good. But you're right as far as when you look at the, especially like the Bernie people, Amy um, didn't do that well. But, but you know, a lot of it's just setting the agenda. And if you don't run uh, on the left side, then everybody goes to the middle and then goes to the right in the general. And so that's, that's part of what we have to do is we have to make sure that we get our voices heard. And I think we did that. Mm. And, you know, Chris did very well. And, and you know, with, against um, the district attorney, uh, Langford came from nowhere with 45%. So that, that's pretty amazing. And filed on the last day, in fact, yeah. Uh, you know, both Democratic candidates for governor talked about banning assault rifles. Uh, and the October 1st shooting has really kind of changed the conversation about that issue here in Clark County. But I remember long before that shooting up in Carson City, there was a bill to ban assault rifles. It was your bill. Uh, so, uh, so people have kind of come around to your way of thinking. Absolutely. That's what I say. I mean, the reality is we have gone so more progressive as a, as a state and, and as a party that um, whoever wins basically is, is going to be fantastic. I mean, especially when you compare it to the Republicans and, and Laxalt as the, as the top of the ticket. I mean, he is just off the charts as far as all that stuff will be bad. So I, I think everyone can get together now and really be, be proud of who we are and what we stand for. That election, I, I guess, uh, will be a real uh, important list, litmus test because there's a lot of people who have said, uh, like Harry Reid, for example, who's been the head of the party for, for a long time, that uh, somebody who is on the liberal side of the party can't win statewide. They point to Jan Jones, Dina Titus, now Chris June Kiliani, Shelley Berkeley. 
uh, uh, all these candidates who ran statewide who lost uh, their races, some by very close margins, some by larger margins. Um, do you think he's right, uh, or, or do you think, as you said earlier, that the, the center of gravity is shifting a little bit to the left, even among those candidates that win? I, th I think it's clearly shifting to the left, and, and um, it's really a lot on voter turnout and voter registration, but, but we've become so much more progressive as a state, and, and you know, the, the biggest problem is we have is the people who are natural voters, you know, work, uh, have 24-hour shifts, they're, they're working seven days a week, they have two jobs, they, they, the last thing in the world they have to do is vote. And so it's, it's really tough for them to, to get out and get organized, and that's our job is to, is to make it easy for them to vote, make sure they're registered. But we've kind of learned that in 2016, and so now if we can just reduplicate, or not reduplicate, duplicate that in 2018, I think we can really be a winner. And, and you know, we haven't had a Democrat governor for 20 years. That is so critical to have a Democrat governor. All, a lot of things you don't realize, the bills that, that the, this past governor, Sandoval, has vetoed, just things like gun gun registration and things, um, it, it really make a huge difference for our state. We need to make sure that people understand that. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, We should note in your race, there is still one thing left to do from the primary. The, uh, the uh, Your opponent, Marco Hernandez, has asked for a recount uh, of all those votes. They're, so they have to go and, and, and recount those votes. Do you expect the results to change at all? Everybody I talked to, everybody has said that the margin I have, which is about 1%, uh, there's never been a uh, recount that, that overturned something like that, so I'm not sure where, where he's going with it. But he's hired a prominent law firm, and I, I'm, I know them well, so I don't think they would do something frivolously, so that maybe they see something I don't see. And at the end of the day, if it turns out that the recount that he won, you know, I'll support him. I, you know, that's what elections are for. You, you determine who got the most votes and, and, and go with that. But based on everything I know, uh, there's no way that, that they can succeed that recount. Yeah. And that prominent law firm you mentioned is uh, the law firm of Lieutenant Governor Mark Hutchison. You say you're confident they won't do anything frivolous, but they did try to recall three state senators unsuccessfully, we should add. Well, uh, anyway. <laughs> I would just say this. Uh, Mark and I are, are, go way back. We're great friends. Uh, without him, we wouldn't have the marijuana program we have today. So I worked with him, and I don't think he's the lead attorney on this case. But, but again, I mean, recounts basically say who should have won. And if, if it turns out that whatever reason, the, he had more votes than I did, then I have no problem with that. I'll, I'll be a state senator anyway, so, um, you know, I, the voters, let the voters speak. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the commission. Uh, uh, should you get elected, uh, what, what are your priorities? You're known, uh, really, as, as the guy who finally brought marijuana legalization uh, for the medical marijuana and then later also for recreational marijuana, finally across the finish line. It had, it had kind of lingered for a long time in the legislature. Uh, but uh, but you pushed it uh, across the line. But other than marijuana, what what are some of your other priorities of the county commission? I, I think the biggest one is is the quality of life. You know, we have been through such a terrible time in the past ten years uh, that you know we basically just were trying to survive, and and so a lot of government services uh, really fell by the wayside. Um, and so I think we need to try to build those back up, make sure the streets are clean, the neighborhoods are clean, um, and, and, and remind people that the reason we're here to begin with is to enjoy ourselves. We get such caught up in the rat race that we forget that the whole goal of government is to make life easier for people, the schools better, the roads better, the air quality better, um, and then take a long view. Let's look at where we're going to go. I'm not going to be around forever, but I'd like to say my legacy was we looked at the next 30 years and planned it out. And then just to make one project after another other project without looking at the whole entirety. Because you know we have a limited amount of water, and you bring in a big project, that's going to take 5% or 10% of the rest of our water. Is that what we want to do? Let, let's debate those kind of issues. You know, that you, that's an interesting point. The, the Southern Nevada Water Authority recently said that if growth resumes at its previous pace, that they will have enough water to accommodate all, all of that growth. Uh, and the debate prior to the recession was uh, should they, should they do that? Is that a wise use of, of the resources that we have? And uh, the, there was a project to draw rural, rural water from a pipeline in, in eastern Nevada. That's still on the drawing board. Uh, that's still something they may pursue. Um, uh, do you think that, uh, do you think that uh, we need to have that conversation or is the Water Authority just too uh, uh, accommodating, I guess, for, for the growth that we have? I, th I think their history is they're too accommodating. First off, I'm strongly opposed to that pipeline. I, I think that that's the wrong way to go. I think we need to live within our in our resources. Mm -hmm. And secondly, everything they have is based upon 300,000 acre feet coming out of that river. Yeah. The fact is that river doesn't sustain that. So I think we need to look at a 10 or 20 percent reduction in that. So maybe 250,000, 240,000 acre feet, which may turn the whole dynamic. 
Yeah. But let's have that debate. Let's let's now you want to debate it before you run out of water, as opposed to you know, 20 years or 30 years from now when we run out of water. Yeah. But we do know that there is a finite amount of water, and and this valley is also a beautiful little valley. So one of the debates is going to be: Do we want to reach all the way up to Mesquite and all the way to State Line? And I think again, that's that's something we need to think twice about. I mean, I would rather push it back in and grow up as opposed to everybody having a single family house and, and a yard and everything, which is a good a good goal, but is that the best way to use that limited amount of water? Yeah. Now a lot of people will hear that and they'll say, well you're talking about growth controls. You're talking about government limiting the growth of of the valley, of developers uh, and, and their ability to build houses and all, all of that. Is that what you're talking about? Well, I'm, I'm talking about let's at least look at how big can we ultimately be and then say, do we want to try to push that in a certain direction or we just want to let the free market go and, and let it happen. But if we're going to do that, let's at least debate that issue. And, and I think we can mo more control how, how it ends up, maybe not limit how much we can grow every year, but at least control where we want to be and, and, and who we want to be. I see us as like a little Vermont, uh, you know, a pristine area, a beautiful area, but a, a restricted area as opposed to a Los Angeles or a Denver, which is just totally uncontrolled growth. and, and um, I, I, you know, our, our roads are open. One of the things about Las Vegas is every time we finally catch up to the roads or the schools, growth takes over and then we're, we're behind. So we have problems with roads, our schools are overcrowded. Wouldn't it be great to have a situation where the schools actually were built before the, the, the projects so that the classes weren't overflowing? Hmm. Um, one of the other issues that, that uh, has uh, come up uh, in recent days with the county is the, the, the uh, Department of Family Services and taking care of children that are in that system. Uh, there was a statistic uh, that, uh, that we had uh, on our air, Vanessa Murphy doing the reporting on that, that said 50% of all the children who die uh, uh, in Clark County have an open file with the county's uh, uh, Child Services Department. So what can be done to, 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 to fix that? What, what has to be done to, to, to fix that? Because it seems if the county can't uh, keep children from from dying when they're in the system, uh, then that's the ball game right there. Yeah. Well, again, it, it's like our school system, and you can talk about trying to make it better, but at the end of the day, you probably need more money, more resources, more so social workers, more psychologists, um, and then if we're going to have these these family homes or, or th that, you need to make sure that they're 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 better maintained, and people have to step forward and, and offer to be foster parents. One of the problems is finding good foster parents. And now that we have an aging population like me, uh, I don't see why some of us couldn't go back out there and offer to, to be involved in that stuff. There's a lot of people out here that are looking for something to do, even as volunteers. So let's, try, let's reach out and try to take advantage of that. We have a tremendous retired population here, hmm. and they can't play golf 24-7. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I, they can. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the, you had another bill up in Carson City that I uh, took note of. I was driving into work today and I passed two, two construction zones where there were cones set up, there were, uh, there were barrels set up, there were little signs closing the lane. There wasn't a soul in sight, there was no work being done. It was just closed lanes and it was, uh, I was scratching my head to say why are these lanes closed. Now you had a bill that said you can't do that until there's actual work going on and then when the work is done you got to open the lane up again. Um, that bill didn't pass in Carson City, but is that something you could take on at the county commission and, and get that done? I would hope so. Uh, you know, they call the orange cone the state flower. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty crazy, and it's all around. And the other thing is, do we have to tear up every road at once? I mean, couldn't you say, let's tear up this road today, and then uh, two months from now, tear up that road? But to have every road have one cone somewhere uh, seems a little crazy. But I'm sure there's a, there's a reason why it's, it's how it is, so I don't want to be... Um, say I can solve the problem, but it's certainly worth looking at. And again, why can't they take the cones out at night and put them back up during the day? And 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 if they're going to put them up, put them up right when it's going to happen. They, they put them up like six o'clock in the morning, right before traffic, sure. and then the construction workers don't come till nine. I mean, let, let's say let's put them up between nine and three when people aren't using the roads. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, and those lanes could be open. Well, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about uh, ha has to do with marijuana, and it has to do with this law called the States Act, uh, which essentially allows state regulation on marijuana to override the uh, federal government's laws that say marijuana is illegal. Um, uh, that, uh, Catherine Cortez Masto is one of the uh, people behind that. Um, uh, how important is it for something like that to pass? Well, I guess I should ask you first, do you think something like that will pass, and how important is that for Nevada's industry? Well, this, this bill actually is the first one that has a legitimate chance 
because it, her co-sponsor, uh, Elizabeth Warren is the sponsor and her co-sponsor is Cory Gardner. Um, and he's a Republican. The president has actually said he supports the bill. So um, I'm sure he'll get passed by November. And, and to her, her credit, our senator, Senator Cortez Masto, was the first co-sponsor that Elizabeth Warren picked. So um, the, the industry is so big. There's so much out there as far as cash and banking problems. Um, it, it really, it's just ne necessary. And, and I think both parties are starting to realize that it's actually an issue which voters kind of care about too. So uh, the Republicans are starting to look at this and say, look, we're losing a couple of points every election because we're anti-marijuana. So they're trying to change. And Schumer is just this week is going to introduce a bill that, that legalizes marijuana at a federal level. So it's the parties are trying to race to see who can get ahead of each other. But it really is critical. That it's it's the banking part. It's the fact that it's not legal. It's the 280E, which is a tax problem. All those things. Um, once that's solved, then the industry is, is ready to go. You know, we, we just are ready, actually we're gonna celebrate the first anniversary of, of legalized marijuana in Nevada. Uh, the, 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 there's been very, virtually no problem in the industry. We've sold over a million dollars a day, um, and now we're up to about a million and a half dollars a day. Uh, the tax revenues are gonna be $120 million for the total state. Um, it, it's really incredible what they've done. And, and you know, we've also decriminalized it, so all those resources that were used to try to arrest people are no longer being used. But so I'm very proud of it. We do need to though end up having some place where people can use, especially tourists, right. because we, not everybody has a house, and, and that's one thing that I'm going to focus on too. And and uh, I want to uh, address that in just a second. But uh, in terms of the current state of law, if nothing changed, is the current business model sustainable? If nothing changes, absolutely. Um, the fact is, they're 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 finally making money with recreational, and so. But it, it the, the biggest problem is the banking you know, with 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 cash. Um, it's, it's just a very scary thing, and it, it's just a matter of time before somebody gets shot or held hostage. Um, and there's no reason for it. I mean, the fact is, if if we can put it in the bank, we're going to get more tax revenue. You know, anytime you have that much cash, something's going to go out the back door. Something's going to get lost. So it's they actually had to hire more people at the state just to count the cash. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Now uh, the uh, the current uh, county commission uh, basically said that they didn't want to take on the issue of marijuana lounges. Um, there was no provision in the uh, in the initiative that legalized marijuana for lounges, but a, a legislative council bureau opinion said that local governments are empowered to uh, to uh, grant licenses for those types of businesses, even without a state law that would uh, would legalize them. Uh, the current county commission said, "Listen, we we don't want to build our house on that uh, opinion." Uh, but it sounds like you've got a different uh, view of that. Yeah, I actually asked for that opinion uh, because the legislative attorneys told me that's what they thought was legitimate. I, my understanding is that the county council also agrees with that. Mm. So, um, you know, given the the need for this, I don't see any reason to wait for legislation. Uh, you know, again, depending on who's the governor, we might get the legislation passed, but, but let's just get moving. I mean, it's the public is so far ahead of the politicians when it comes to marijuana that it's, it's really time to get moving. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've always noticed the uh, the evolution as a, as a state lawmaker becomes a local lawmaker, and and the the uh, the varying respect for Dylan's rule <laughs> starts to fade out as you as you uh, go to that local office. Yeah, I, I will say this: um, I, I do think there's a lot of things. To, we have 75 percent of the population here in Clark County, so a lot of things in the legislature are kind of stopped when you have to get the two-thirds vote because the rest of the state will, will say no and we, we really want to do it. Mm. So I think the legislature, I'm going to encourage them to give us authority. I mean, we may not want to do it, but why not give the Clark County Commission authority to enact a sales tax or other taxes uh, to do things that we need here in, in Las Vegas that, that maybe they don't want to do in Tonopah or do in Elko. Yeah. But, but we can't let the rest of the state the tail wag the dog. I mean, we are the big boys and we just need to step up to the plate and, and do things. And when that happens, the, the enabling legislation for something like that would not have to pass by two-thirds, right? Absolutely. But the vote at the county level would have to be two-thirds. The legislative attorney said not even that. said a majority, hmm. the, the, just so you know, the, the county, the state legislature, the majority vote that the governor signed that could give us authority to tax ourselves, and then by a majority vote, we could approve that tax. Without a two-thirds. Right. So how would the two-thirds uh, uh, rule play into that? It doesn't, it doesn't impact it. At least that's what the legislative attorneys say. Hmm. But you know, I'm not saying we would do it. We probably want to do some kind of referendum with the people and see what they want to do. But, but, but at least give us that authority. I mean, it, it's we we are so hamstrung by this two-thirds rule. It's killing us. Yeah. La last question on on uh, the marijuana subject, and that is, 
um, President Trump has indicated that he might embrace a bill that would simply remove marijuana from the list of controlled substances, that it would no longer be an illegal drug uh, in, in any sense. That would seem to solve all the problems that we have been talking about, the lounges, the banking, uh, a, a, other things like that. Would that be the easiest and most elegant way to solve this problem? It, it probably would, but that's probably the, the, the toughest one to do. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about it is um, we don't want to make it too easy because big pharma, big tobacco, and big alcohol will come in and just swallow it up. What we've really created is a, is a great little industry in Nevada, 6,000 jobs, half a billion dollars invested. They said we're, we're generating um, $120 million a year in taxes. If, if they came in and swallowed it up, then, then we're going to lose a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. So I think that if we could just get something like the, the bill that uh, Senator Warren and Senator Gardner have done um, to start with, you know, in a few years we can go that route. But we always want to have a state option because if, if California can bring stuff or we can cross the line, the state lines, um, that's just going to kill us because, you know, Northern California, they have so much stuff, it's, they don't even know what to do with it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and one last question uh, on the whole uh, uh, subject of taxation. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, increasing the sales tax, but uh, the local governments have been really hurt the most by the property tax caps that were put in place before the recession because home prices were rising so quickly, people are having trouble paying those taxes. So those caps were put in place with no sunset and no means of adjustment. Now that the recession has hit and we're kind of clawing our way back uh, to where we used to be, those caps have really kept local government revenues suppressed. Um, do you think those caps ought to be uh, abolished? Should they be adjusted? How should that uh, work? I'm not sure the exact formula, but they definitely need to be, be analyzed and, and people need to realize that, that everybody says, well, we're back to where we were before 2008, but we're not, as you said, as far as tax revenues. And at 3% growth a year, uh, we're never going to get there. Uh, at least take it off of, of uh, business taxes or business properties. Um, but as far as the, the housing, that's going to be a little touchy. The other thing is, I, I didn't even realize this, is that we have basically a Prop 13 on steroids. In California, Prop 13 caps your property tax until you sell the property. Yeah. In, in Nevada, we, we cap it forever. So we actually have a reduction in your house. I have a house that's 50 years old. My, my taxes are, are much less than it is for somebody who just bought a house the same value. Hmm. So we need to have at least something which triggers it every time you sell the property, the tax rate goes up to the value of the house. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Well, Tex Eggerman, thanks very much for joining us, and uh, good luck in your, uh, in your, uh, first in your recount and then in your uh, general election race, and we'll hope to have you back soon. Thank you. Hopefully next time I see you, I'll be a county commissioner, but if not, I'll still be a state senator. Yeah, either way, either <laughs> way. Thanks a lot. Thank you.